Hello, and welcome to the Old Man Orange Podcast. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. And I'm Ryan Dunnigan. Yeah, we're going with a, a double feature, super, like, you know. In a sense, these are, like, those kind of two movies that when I think of, like, filmmaking as a kid, or, you know, I guess in high school, same thing. That's a kid. Everybody I feel that's underneath my age nowadays is a kid, or a boy, or a girl. That's like, you're not a man, you're underneath my age, you're a boy. Come this way, child. It's like I'm yeah. 25. You're like, well, you're a child to me. <laughs> you know? In 2008, how old were you? Well, well, I guess I was only like 12. See, you were a child. <laughs> I was a man. <laughs> but um, but th- this, these are those kind of movies like that I think of like, that sort of define like, you almost like watch this and you go, holy shit! Like, you know what? If if we just have the right, you know, angles and just get enough, you know, people in, we could make a movie kind of of similar low budget caliber. You know what I mean? Like, it, these are like those movies I just feel that really like inspire you to kind of be able to say like, hey, you know what? I think we might be able to pull something, maybe not as good, but you know, we could we could go out this route. It's a very inspiring movie, and that's Yo Jimbo and a Fistful of Dollars. Especially at the time, was being you know. Um living in a, in a small uh, mountain town with a gold mining history, it was very easy to just think, you know what, we can go into like downtown Columbia or even parts of Sonora, and as long as we're there at a certain time of day where no one else is around, yeah. and we only stay up so you never see the ground cement, you could probably fool yourself and think this is a old-timey western. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, harder than we thought, but still <laughs> didn't stop us from trying a couple of times. And I'll say, uh, for a long time, I was kind of a little bit of a... In the grand... I guess in the scheme of my life, I guess uh, in the grand scheme of my life, I was a little late to the party on westerns. I knew of them, and I didn't dislike them. I just it was like, oh, that's what my dad watches. Yeah. But I remember seeing... Being in high school and seeing... Uh, kill bill and then noticing this thing's making references to westerns and all that and kill bill was my introduction to tarantino so i was like all right well what inspired tarantino so then i kind of went and looked and there is this old uh used video game store in sonora called player's kingdom Mm -hmm. they would sell a bunch of used video games and movies and i was like oh there's a clint eastwood movie here it's called a fistful of dollars i wonder if this is a big one yeah, <laughs> not, re- not realizing what I had in my hand right <laughs> not there. Not realizing you're probably holding, like, top five best Clint Eastwood movies. Yeah, yeah. You know how sometimes you'll, like, get, like, an album of something and you, like, well, th- it, it, I like it, but it doesn't really blow me away. I'm so glad the first one I grabbed was, like, um, Fistful of Dollars and not, like, Pale Rider or uh, Joe Kidd. Not that those movies or, are like, bad. Paint your wagon, and then you'd just be like, oh, he must just <laughs> only do musicals. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not even that those two movies I just named off, or Paint Your Wagon, are bad movies. They're just like, they're they're, they're just. I don't think they're his best work. You know what I mean? They're just yeah, not. They don't they're, have they're, the they're not the. Yeah, you because so, sometimes when you start off with something, it, it, you know, some people think you got to almost kind of work its way up. No, no, I feel like you need to start off with kind of like the big stuff, and once you really like that, then you'll start appreciating like the kind of a little bit more mediocre movies. You know what I mean? Yeah, and. Or Hang em High. Like, I think Hang em High has the coolest concept, but it just kind of like, there are more out there, you gotta go find them. See you in the sequel. Yeah. It never came out. Yeah. Um, or unless that's never intended for a sequel. Who knows? But, um... The sequel's in your I'm, mind, Ryan. <laughs> well, that's just such a cool concept. One guy is mistaken for someone else, so he's hung, he survives, mm-hmm. and he just goes on a rampage after the guys that did it. That's, like, the coolest concept, but, like, it takes a big, like, let's stop for a second and just have, like, a day picnic with this girl and who's depressed looking for her husband or whatever. You know what I mean? But aside the point, Fistful of Dollars, watching it, it was one of those things where I just remember, like, enjoying it. And then like, as it went on, like, oh, my God, this movie's fucking amazing. How did I never see this before? Mm-hmm. And then not long ago i feel dumb not long ago i found out maybe about like four or five years ago that it was based on an, on a japanese movie an akira kurosawa movie of all things too yeah i guess my kind of lead in because I, I saw the good the bad the ugly i remember as a kid it was on like tcm or something like you know in the, in the 90s or something like that 
And I saw that one, you know, or at least parts of it. I don't, you can't remember exactly, but like that was kind of there. So it's like I kind of knew what it was, but I didn't see a fistful of dollars till probably around that same high school era, and we started sharing movies and so on. Be like, hey, there's other ones, or a few dollars more, especially, which is actually my favorite of all three of those, you know. But um, you know, from there, and then I. I remember seeing kind of somewhere that like, oh, this related to Yojimbo, but probably it was maybe like 10 years ago. I rented, I remember renting Yojimbo on the Netflix DVDs, you know, and that's where I kind of saw it there on like the Criterion version and so on. It was like, oh my God, this one's, I mean, I know it's like, you know, the same kind of general core storyline, but just the whole idea, it's like, hey, it's that with Samurais. I'm, I'm 100% sold here. This is fantastic. It's shot well, got great action. It's got humor. You know what I mean? It's almost like, when I think of Yojimbo 2, it's like that one thing about Japanese movies, you kind of forget, because you think of anime, but then it's also like, well, really, all the anime kind of, like, tropes and so on stuff, they all come from Japanese movies, really. <laughs> like, because Japanese movies are just, like, slightly toned down versions of, like, animes. And, you know, some of them are almost, like, even more anime than, you know, than you think. Because you do have a lot of people just angry and yelling at each other the whole time. Like, Watching, watching, because this is the first time I've watched The Ojimbo, and it was a movie I was meaning to get to for a while. I'm like, well, what better way to do it for a podcast, you know? So, yeah. Um, Yojimbo, I feel like there is enough similarities here to call Fistful of Dollars a uh, Western remake of that, but there's still enough differences to watch between the two. Like, if you prefer samurai movies over Westerns, you watch Yojimbo, vice versa for Fistful. Um... I remember watching, when watching Yojimbo, the big stark difference, I think, is Yojimbo, when the, the way they portray the villains in that. First off, they're always yelling, they're always angry, and I think that stems from Kabuki theater, just because everyone's over, at least over the top. At least that's when we're reading or somewhere. But, um... Because that's where Bruce Lee got his acting style from, as he took it from that Japanese kind of slightly over-the-top acting. Though he's surprisingly really reserved. He's just kind of <laughs> like... He's like just a... a, 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 a bottle of soda you just shook up just like crazy it just waits for it to there. crack it yeah exactly that's what kind of like bruce lee's acting to me you know he's just calm and it's like Wah! you know just like kills everybody in the room um yo jimbo's villains i feel like in this they're way more buffoonish and they're meant to be there for almost comic relief but then there is as, as things go on even though they're buffoons and they're idiots they have they're a little more they're, they're almost darker, they too, dangerous. at the same time, in weirder ways. It's like, what's it, what's an idiot going to do when an idiot's pushed to his limits? It's not going to be like, oh, he's a fucking idiot. He's going to trip over his own balls in the process. No, no, maybe one or two of them might, but they're going to start getting scared, and they're going to start getting more ruthless. And then I feel like Fistful, it's more consistent the whole way. Like, there's one group that's clearly more of a threat than the other, but they're still both, like, someone you don't want to fuck with mostly yeah exactly well you know the, the real buffoon they're actually like in both of them there's like the, the first guy that they almost run into generally well i guess not the first guy in yojimbo because yojimbo he runs into that like father and sorry he's like that damn son of mine just doesn't want to work on the farm I'm like dad i don't want to do it i want to be free and fly off the eagles I'm like no oh, no son of mine's gonna fly off the eagles you're gonna work a hard life he's like i don't want to eat cruel dad <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Jimbo's just kind of there watching. He's like, "Yo, I'm taking some water." I'm like, it's, like, it's not even like, "Hey, man, have some water." I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take some. Like, could you imagine the strangers walking to your house, being like, "Yo, I'm taking some water," <laughs> opening the fridge, cracking open a bottle or something like that, just or just drinking straight out of the faucet, no cup, grabbing a beer, <laughs> just prop, just props his feet up on the coffee table, watches this. They just keep on yelling like, "I told you I want to fly." You've been hanging out with those Wright brothers too much, haven't you? <laughs> Yeah, I know it's the 1860s, but still, come on. <laughs> Which really, I will say this, like, I always, it's like one of those movies, like, probably in Japan, you know exactly what year it is when you watch it, but when you kind of watch this, like, you know, in America, you're kind of like, I guess this could be almost any year between, like, 1400s, 1800s, until the guy pulls a gun out, they're like, oh, that tells me exactly what year it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, check this out, I got this from the old Western set, like, the one dude walking around in town with a gun. Well, there's even, like, kind of going back to comparisons between Yojimbo and Fistful of Dollars. Because, you know, for those who've never seen either of these movies, basically what it is is the concept is a lone stranger walks into a town. The town is basically dead because on one side of the town you have a, uh, you have a crime family, another side of the town, another crime family. And they're 
they're basically their war is just destroying this town. It's like that episode I realized after the fact. I'm like, oh, oh, Pokemon did a parody of this episode back in season one. There's the town, there's the one clan that had a Scyther, another ta- side of the town that had an Electabuzz. Yep. And I was like, oh, shit. When I saw Fistful of Dollars, that just clicked. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's amazing how much, because this thing does have, like, there is there is even beyond just these two main movies, it's like there's a lot of spinoffs and life on it. I mean, I mean, geez, even Back to the Future Part 3 u- utilizes a lot of elements of Fistful of Dollars in it. You know? Mm-hmm. And so on, uh, but, um, but yeah, so you got these warring groups on each side. They've pretty much scared off all like the regular folks, except for you know the cantina owner or you know, the restaurant guy in um, Japan and whatnot. And so this this like that's the like grave the old digger, yeah, and the, and the, the grave casket digger. makers making bank. That's the one thing. The only <laughs> yeah. booming business in town is the casket maker in both movies. And I love it, yo, Jimbo, because the guy who owns the restaurant just is like such like a fucking like that fucking casket maker. Jesus Christ, he's over there hammering again. Hey, shut the fuck up, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I got a customer in here. <laughs> just smiling, like, just keeps on going, like oh fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, it's like, is this just what happens every day? You Best know? day of that casket maker's life up to that point was probably like, God, I can't wait for like the fucking, for the store owner to, or the restaurant owner to die, because that way I don't have to hear it no more, and I'm still just maybe making me some caskets. Granted, it doesn't happen as the movie goes on, but yeah, at that <laughs> moment in time. And I just love even just when you get your main character and Yojimbo and whatnot, just the Ronin dude walking around. I love, there's something, because this is almost the thing that makes, I, I think, Akira Kurosawa movies kind of neat, is I like the way that he almost can describe a character. is like, there's like, almost, he'll do it without like, like the little talking, but he'll do it with like, just like certain actions and so on. Cause you know, I mean, the movie literally starts in Yojimbo and he comes up and he's doing like the Goku head scratch is like, as the credits are rolling. And I love how he's like, oh, there's a fork on the road. He takes a stick and throws it up in the air. Where the stick lands, oh, okay, I'll walk that direction. Like that guy has like the most ultimate freedom, <laughs> and he even has like a um, when he always has like he never like he barely ever has his arms in his sleeves. He's always just resting his arms in his kimono. Yeah, you know, and that whole thing. And he's always kind of like just kind of stretching his shoulders, like he's a little stiff, and he's looking to kind of like get into some action, sorta. And where Clint Eastwood, he's a little bit more of like stone face because it almost seems like. I can see, um, what's the actor's name in Yojimbo? Uh, Shiro, um, what was Toshiro it? Uh, Mifuni? Yeah. I could almost see him being sort of this, like, inspiration point. I'm sure he's inspired off old tales, but I can see him being an inspiration point for a lot of characters and, like, fighting games and, and anime, you know? Like, I could, like, Mifuni, Soul Calibur, most obvious one, you know? Um, or Mitsurugi, you mean? Mitsurugi, Mitsurugi, yeah, yeah. Mitsurugi. Or, or even like an um, uh, shit Samurai Showdown. I know, I know. Showdown. He's... Yeah. Hiname or Haname, I, I forgot his name, but uh, Hidero, Hidero, something yeah. like that. Something like that. Um, but but yeah, the but main character of it. Just that kind of like he's really skilled, but he's almost just kind of like wandering and like, oh, whatever happens, happens. He's not really all that you know stressed about anything, you know. Well, I, I, what I like about Yojimbo, though, almost in that, because it's almost the difference between the two characters between um, in that movie and in uh, with Clint Eastwood and Fistful of Dollars, is I feel like in Yojimbo, he's coming in and he's just really more all, almost kind of just like a guy who's just like, oh, this town's all messed up. Well, I'm gonna fuck with everybody in here and just kind of like for my entertainment pleasure because you know what? There's no TV in 1860, so this because <laughs> so many times he'll he'll go and he'll just talk smack to each side and then he'll climb up into this little tower and just sit there and watch it and just like, <laughs> look at him go. Well, he goes in there. I guess the big difference between the two is, I mean, ultimately, same goal, same process, but different motivation, I guess. Clint Eastwood sees a bunch of people like god these are a bunch of fucking idiots too busy measuring getting a dick measuring contest and they're also destroying the town around them i don't feel bad about killing them so what i can do is i can make some money off all off both of them while they kill each other i can pit them against each other i can pretend like i'm a double agent mm. kind of like it's kind of like really really early departed <laughs> to a certain extent <laughs> like i'm pretend to pretend to be a double agent to go over there and vice versa to the other side and um and Yojimbo, he does the same, but rather than being kind of like, here's a good money-making opportunity, he comes in like, you know what, all I'm good is a killing. 
but there's a lot of people here that deserve to die, so don't feel bad about it. Yeah. And his whole thing is, like, he's trying to bring peace to this town while Clint Eastwood just sees a money-making opportunity. And if he can save someone in the process, cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean they're both kind of there because, like, you know, the load Ronin dude needs needs cash, too. But, like, he just feels like he's also, like, he's saving. It's almost like he's doing He's got multiple agendas. Like, he, he needs some money. He's going to save some people process because he just happens to be a good guy. But at the same time, he also enjoys sort of like this, like pitting these people against each other and whatnot, you know. And I know what it is. I think because where Clint Eastwood does it, I mean, it's almost like he pits him against two and I feel like he enjoys it. But it feels like they enjoy it way more in Yojimbo. Like this is just, this is this guy. Like he probably just goes from town to town and just stirs shit up. <laughs> just goes over there just like yo so and so was talking some shit oh that motherfucker <laughs> yeah. grab your katanas boys <laughs> yeah because that's, that's just what I feel like it's sort of like I'm actually kind of surprised because this movie almost I know that there's other kind of movies and stuff that use it but like this almost feels like this is set up to be like sort of like a spy versus spy not necessarily like the Mad Magazine thing but like you know what I mean like this could be a very good like espionage style like overlay to it too where someone's going back and forth and just really messing with like each other's government yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I'm curious to see the sequels to this. The sequels are less... Because the whole thing when he was making Yojimbo, he wanted to make a Western... He wanted to make a samurai movie that played by the rules of a Western, mm -hmm. which is very interesting, because then an Italian dude saw that, like, that's an awesome concept for a Western, because it is a Western <laughs> concept. Well, because so, well, really, at the same time, it's like, they really are both Western era. It's, they're both, like, you know, give or take 1860. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's just it's just Western on the East Side. Pretty much it is. And the whole thing where, um, I just realized I'm on IMDb, and for some reason, for Yo Jimbo, they have a still of Mandalorian shit in here. I don't know well, why. Well, realistically, uh, let's, let's be honest, Mandalorian kind of is like the Star Wars version of this. Yeah, but still, it's like it's kind of like when you click on the Mario Brothers movie on IMDb, and there's a picture of Sonic for some reason. You know, <laughs> yeah, Sonic from the Sonic from the movie, and then Tails from Sonic Boom photoshopped in there. <laughs> so, but um, anyway, going back to Yojimbo, um, the other thing with him is he seems to be like he is a morally good person. He just has a dark side. Where Clint Eastwood, he's more like neutral. But he, ha he probably leans more good than bad. He's kind of like... Because he's going to do the right thing if someone needs saving. But it's also... He's not going to be nice about it. Because, you know... I, I, if I remember correctly... Because I, I watched uh, I watched um, Fistful of Dollars more recently than Yojimbo. Mm -hmm. I want to say Yojimbo, when he saves the family, he does the right thing. He says, like, just get out of here. Be free. Go, go. You know? Where Clint Eastwood, it's almost like... It's, it reminds me of the scene from Air Bud when he's, like, throwing the ball. <laughs> just go! Just go! <laughs> <laughs> get out of here no one wants you leave leave like he's throwing a ball for the family to chase yeah well because both those like well because like I, and i feel like it seems like it's sort of a little bit more darker in the yojimbo one because like they do the thing where it's like when he goes to save that family because you know it's like there's this lady it's just like oh yeah the, you know the, the lady's married to the husband she's like the best looking you know woman in town and whatnot but just you know the whole gang just literally gang bangs her like in the big house and they built a wax shack for the husband to sit out there so he could watch and jerk off as this happens. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, that's literally what it is. It's just like, there's just, there's this big house and then there's just this wax shack, like right next, literally like right next to it. It's like a tool shed. <laughs> like that to me just seems like, that makes it feel like, so yeah, okay, I gotta really go in there and save this guy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if he's gonna necessarily want his wife after, you know, what she's been through, but still. <laughs> Morally the right thing to do. Well, even the concept of just, like, I want her for myself, you think that's one of the most fucked up things you could do. Like, no, no, no. I want other people to fuck her so I can watch. Like, that's, like, never really thought of it before after this movie. But, like, oh, that's actually a hundred times worse. Yeah, well, well, the husband guy, he's just forced to watch. It's not his, like, it's almost like he's, he stays there just to almost, like, help her out. But it's like he has no power against this gang. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I you're, was thinking, you're thinking of, in Fistful of Dollars, it's a little bit different in that one. No, I'm it? thinking the other way around. I mixed a aspects around it. I, I was thinking the, the head the head boss. No. Because he was married or something. So I was thinking him, the head boss, and wanted his guys to do it rather than him. Never mind. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no. It's more just like this poor that guy. That would be more fucked up, though. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, no, 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 it's just that and this, like, that, and, and the poor kid has to stay there, too, in the house and whatnot, and then, you know, he, he goes in there and just slices that place up and everything. He says, like, the one dumb kind of fact. And I love how, like, it's another Kira Kurosawa one. I like when they, there's kind of, like, the dumb brother henchman in Yojimbo. And, like, the first time you see him, like, almost the way you can tell that he's kind of just, like, a mook is that, like, he goes, like, the cuff maker is, like, he's, like, goes to cuff maker. He's, like, we're going to need a... Uh... He starts counting on his fingers, and he just can't really figure it out, like, what the number is. <laughs> so it's like you kind of know that this guy's just like a dim just because of like all the oh without saying he really is you just kind of tell her after like oh look at this more I mean that and the unibrow but well yeah there's always the thing like <laughs> that's a very Japanese one if you want to make a guy look like an idiot give him a unibrow well that's yeah that is the thing about this movie as opposed to Fistful of Dollars because Fistful of Dollars you can generally tell they're one of two things when you see them but um, you kind of got to wait for them to talk or make their move where right off the bat as soon as you see a character in yojimbo you immediately know what they're about whether it be just the way they look or just mannerisms they have like going like you said the dude who's with the unibrow or then there's the guy who's basically like the japanese andre the giant hanging out there you know yeah i know he's so, almost like it almost probably because I was, just because i was watching like 007 moonraker right like a week before i was like oh shit that's jaws. like the jaws character for this movie <laughs> <laughs> just throwing people around. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't try to bite his ear at some point. And that guy's huge too. Yeah, like you're watching that and like that. Guy, I mean, like maybe he's like normal American height for all we know, but <laughs> <laughs> but like I watched that movie. It's like that guy stand like two feet taller than everybody else there. It's just on a cut. What he just on like a fucking like like a uh, apple box or some shit like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got the super deep. He's got the ultra deep Japanese voice, so you know he is yeah. like a giant. But like that that guy's so cool. That's well, they I, make... I wish that was like in the Fistful of Dollars. I wish they would have found a giant to be in that one, too. Just, I, mean, I guess it doesn't make as much sense because it's guns, so it's not like you don't need that power of, like, you know, manhandling. I guess it's also a thing. That is, it, it's not like this... Um, it's not like that, oh, here is... In some cases it is. Like, here is the Jap here is the um, Western version of that Japanese character. Yeah. There, that is there to some extent, but when it comes to the villains and the henchmen that's where they're just kind of like okay it's, he's just another henchman or the the lady is on this side as opposed to that side because there is the married couple the baxters and um fistful of dollars and yo jimbo i think i might be wrong i want to say he goes to them first to get the, the married the, the married couple the married crime family yeah and then the lady right off the bat <laughs> says you're paying him how much? We could just kill him in our in his sleep and da 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 when he's done. And he's all like, mm, "Fuck this!" In bounces, <laughs> and then in um, in uh, fistful of dollars, it's not the lady saying that; it's one of the brothers. But his whole thing, it's not even like let's it, he 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 doesn't trust him right off the bat because that's the thing. And Yo Jimbo, everyone's like, "Look how good this guy is. We need this guy. If we have this guy, we'll win." Where fistful of dollars nobody entirely trusts him right off the bat but they see how skilled he is so they're kind of like keeping him at arm's length yeah because that's like the whole thing is both these guys are so amazing with their weapons that that's why they he can kind of bounce back and forth between each side you know because everybody's sort of fight it's literally like being on the field and everybody like choosing like you know a player for like dodgeball and everybody wants that one kid and they're fighting back and forth for him yeah like, i'll give you i'll give you a, you know a holographic venusaur to be on the team <laughs> and then there'd be the whole thing where you have you have uh there's some things in like moments in the movie like both sides at the hands of um tira show mifuni or clint eastwood both sides get someone else from that side to the other side and kind of like have this like you know exchange kind of moment they have that but it's just the the person you well, know that one is the kid i want to say that is like the dumbass kid in the uh, Yojimbo version, just like it is in um, in, uh, in uh, Fistful, Fistful of Dollars. Yeah, they, but they, they don't they don't make him as dumb in Fistful though. Well, in Fistful, it's just like mama, mama. Just oh, so not that kid. There's like the blonde guy who's like the son of the. <laughs> mama, mama. Oh, ha, ha, ha. It's so ah. obviously like a lady just trying to do a kid's voice. Like, why can't I see mama? Silence, Zeus. Silence. But mama, it's like. Fuck, this dubbing. Like, generally the dubbing doesn't bother me, but that kid, holy shit. 
Well, yeah, and, you know, and that just comes from the fact that you know both these movies are like you know just dub because that was just how they shot movies over in the east. It's like fuck paying the sound guy. We'll just do it later. <laughs> <laughs> but that one there, it's like that. that one, remember that was like that. Like I remember when I first watched this movie, I didn't really realize this movie was dubbed until I saw that kid. <laughs> that kid gave yeah. it away real fast. Well, it, right off the bat, yeah, the kid's the very obvious one, but there's other things where you look at it and you, if you're looking for it, you can catch, like, the lip sync is off. Yeah. But generally, I, I think you're not really looking for it, because you just assume right off the bat, unless you know your film history before watching it, you know it's Italian, where before going in, I didn't, first time I watched the, first time I watched it, I didn't realize it was Italian, so I was just like, that kid sounds weird. <laughs> well, I remember as a kid, too, it's like, I, I thought them like, oh, shit, I'm like, there, there must be a, an Italian version, that's what I need to get, and so on, and it's like, oh, no, that's just how Italians make movies, they, they, ha they just don't do, they just don't run sound at the same time, and they just put the words in in English later on, because they know that they can sell it worldwide, it's like, oh, okay, I might not just, <laughs> there is an Italian version, but yeah. You know, at least in Yojimbo, you get the Japanese track, so it se seems like it matches, like, really perfect. Yeah. No, um, this one, I, if I have to pick one over, over the other, I would say I think I go with, I mean, it's just a matter of, I think, what I saw first and what I've seen more of, and that is Western, so I'm probably going Fistful, but Yojimbo, it's still just a great movie. It's still, even if you're not really a Western fan, but you love Fistful of Dollars, I think it's really worth seeing Yojimbo just to kind of see earlier version of it if anything yeah well it's funny because they're really not that far off because yojimbo is 61 and uh fistful dollars is 64 so they're like they're like really almost like back to back but one thing that makes yojimbo also too it's like because this probably would have been a big deal back in the day is like just some of the violence in there is like that's really extreme for like early 60s i mean right that first battle when he shows up and the, that gang's kind of like making fun of him and then he just like whips his sword out and just starts slicing guys left and right and then he chops that one dude's arm off and it falls on the ground blood shooting out and so on like you kind of think about it, like if that movie would have probably never like easily got shown to like regular cinemas in the u.s you would have that'd be like a pass around you know film well that also right there that's just because that actually surprised me i assume there'd be a few slashes maybe some blood spray and someone falls over when i first saw that arm come down and, you know, it's a really quick shot, but you can kind of see, like, the meat, and you can also see the bone. That was like, oh, shit, that's that's ballsy for this time, you know, because you wouldn't imagine most movies being that violent then. And then, on top of that, later, you see, like, a dog running with, like, a, <laughs> with a fucking, like, hand in his mouth. Yeah, you see that, you know, and then, like, it just even there it has a couple of those scenes where, like, later on, where he slices a guy, and then the blood just shoots up all over the wall and everything like that. So it's like, there is that cool violence there. Because I will say, like, the one thing that's... I think it's in Fistful of Dollars, I always kind of notice. That that one, between that one, I think, to uh, when you get to a few dollars more, it's like, there's really no blood spurts for the most part in Fistful of Dollars, and then the blood spurts come, in, I want to say, in the second one. Because it Star still has, like... It still has, like, that sort of old Western thing where, like, they get shot and they just kind of, like, oh, grab your heart and fall down. Which is it's, it's not too bad, but, like, I, it sounds weird. Like, that just little bit of extra blood spurt makes a big difference. Like, it really makes a scene pop. Yeah, because, like you said, they do have those moments where they just do just grab their heart and fall over. But they have the other parts where, at the time, it had to be, like, shocking. Where someone gets shot and they fall over and they just have ultra bright red blood on their face just like you know at the time like wait what you, you could do that oh, i cannot believe how violent this movie is like you realize this head would not even be in one piece right now if this thing was more just that super like kind of taxi driver like bright red blood they had on a face you know even though i think this came out first but still yeah this came out way before that but um i do i, I actually like that color like when you get that i almost call it like italian blood because you just see it all the like those kind of films and so on where it's just very vibrant and like it doesn't look realistic at all but it looks almost like artistic in a sense well that's also how going back to like i said taxi driver i guess that's that was one of the reasons i he was able to because originally they wanted him to chop off the end of the movie when he goes in a shooting spree and kills harvey Keitel. But they said like this is too violent like what if we just amp the fuck out of the hue on the blood and make it way more brighter and like unnaturally red i'm like that'll work I'm like it's, fucking thing, but, it's so okay. weird how that is. Just, I, I, I just feel like those rating guys just like they're almost just like a bunch of parrots sit in the room and just like they just their opinion changes like every two seconds. Yeah, you know this is gonna seem off topic for a second, but you know, um, 
you know if you if you play the Link's Awakening remake, <laughs> there's those things. <laughs> Very weird random comparison, but there are those things in like some of the temples. They look like, like birds or penguins. They just turn their head like burr, 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 burr. They, they teleport every time you try to like slash at them. Yep. I just imagine that being like the the mo the, the motion picture association board. Just, burr, burr, you can't you can't no no smoking. You can't smoke. You can't smoke. You know, just going back and forth. You know. Yeah. Just just. just stupid stuff like that but um yeah that, that would have well, that would have been brighter yeah who knows like what like with yojimbo i mean maybe if it's in black and white it's not nearly as graphic feeling i don't know mm -hmm. at that time period though it's like black and white still like a common format so it's not like i think black and white almost makes it it's kind of weird how some of those rules work i think black and white because it makes it usually a little darker and I think that just makes it seem a little bit more grimmer, even though it's not real. It's even though it's not like real, it just makes it seem a little bit more darker and somber. So whenever they have a scene in the movie where just like we're gonna like and kill Bill, going back to that, when the reason why they make that whole scene where the brides killing a bunch of Japanese dudes in black and white is because otherwise we'd have got NC-17 if it was in color, which is like it's so fucking stupid. You can totally tell what she's doing. Yeah, is that like, their only reason why why Schindler's List was in black and white? <laughs> well, black and white's gonna soften the blow on all this Jew killing. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those ones. Like, I, 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 yeah, it's like it's so weird how that kind of is. You know, it, it, the upsides I feel like we're generally pat. Well, now we got like stupider other reasons. Now it's like, oh, a guy pulled out a cigarette in the movie. It's, make it's rated R now. Like now, now there's that kind of bull crap. So it's like it's almost it goes like more retarded in other directions. But oh, we'll leave the guy getting his head chopped off and the blood shooting everywhere, and you know somebody clapping behind him, and you know a kid doing a backflip on a skateboard and then blowing up. Like you know that's fine. But you know Jesus Christ, a guy he lit a cigarette. <laughs> a kid could see this movie and then go like, whoa, cool, cigarettes are cool. And then next thing you know, he's got lung cancer and he's dead, because that's what movies do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so it is kind of like, well, I want to say even Yojimbo, like, it, it just kind of shows where you sometimes you think of, like, well, uh, this is the, the standard, this is the norm, and people need to realize that, but Yojimbo at the time was, like, really criticized for the amount of violence it had, and the Fistful of Dollars films, the movie, or that whole series, I don't think it was all that, they made money, but they weren't really well respected among a lot of people when they came out, and it's just like, show us the fuck you guys know. <laughs> Well, because that was the thing is because that almost like that that's there's there's sort of a split because the fistful of dollars like that trilogy, it's like because you know all the older people are like that's not a western. Well, these Italians think that they're doing. We kicked their ass in World War Two and they think they can make our genre. Blah 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 blah. So there was that kind of thing, and then there was almost like the the you know the cool hip kids of like the sixties, like I guess you would say like. George Lucas, you know, driving his car like, oh, I'm going to go see this whole dollars today. You know, like those, those kind of people of that time era and so on. And that was who it almost kind of appealed to. It was almost the younger guys like, yeah, man, I want to see that blood. And he, yeah, he's a cool, badass man. You know, kind of almost that like post beatnik era, but sort of pre-hippie era. Like that's that's where it's sort of fallen into. And I think it, it's like there's that divide. Because I just remember, you, you don't really hear about it anymore, but there used to be that, do you remember that old person argument <laughs> That used to be like the John Wayne or Clint Eastwood thing. And then you get the old person like, ah, oh, Clint Eastwood, not this guy again. Some young hippie coming in, playing jazz music like a maniac. That's not a cowboy. Now it's like Clint Eastwood's become the very thing that old people like love. It just, it's just it's just a generational thing. I mean, well, that's Clint the Eastwood's thing, because now thing, those people yeah. are all like, yeah, I. I grew up with Clint Eastwood, so that's why it's like their kind of guy and so on. So, but I just remember that as a kid growing up, there was always that kind of like competition. But yeah, well, the other thing that's also kind of interesting is there's almost like there's a bunch of these other kind of spinoffs that actually sound kind of interesting that, you know, take the, in a sense, the Yojimbo storyline of the two rival gangs and do it in other genres. There's one called The Warrior and the Sorceress, which does it like a sword and sandals, and it's got David Carradine stars in it. And it's done by Roger Corman. Like, that one just sounds kind of interesting and kind of badass. There's one called Last Man Standing, which is like the Prohibition one with Bruce Willis, directed by Walter Hill. I know I have that one in a Bruce Willis set. I just don't think I've ever watched that one before. Oh, wow. But, I like, you know, know that. that kind of cool thing. And then there's this other one that I was kind of seeing, too. There's, there's a one called Omega Doom that has Rutger Hauer in it. And it's like a sci-fi version of it where there's, like, robots on one side and humans on the other or something like that. Like, all these ones just sound... Like, because this is that, that kind of, like, core storyline that, like, can work so many ways 
and you know you just kind of use the main parts of it and then you can do whatever you want like on the in-betweens and it's just set up on a different genre and it totally works yeah yeah that is something that stands out about it because it does seem inherently like very western or samurai-ish but it could be kind of utilized to anything just because there's something about like two idiot sides that are ruining it for everybody else i think everybody could relate to that in some way yeah exactly it just like what guy kind of shows up and that's almost i mean even like it sounds kind of weird but almost even uh mad max 2 the road warrior is kind of really a yojimbo style like this lone warrior drives on in there's this town it's like hey we need some help except that was a little bit different because i guess it's one person needs help against rival games but you know it, it, he's not going back and forth <laughs> he fucking messed up in mad max like, going back and forth between them <laughs> You know. I'll give you this, like, you know, he just punches out the little boy with the boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, it, in a sense, it kind of has that similar thing, because, you know, at the same time with both these stories, once the whole thing sort of solved, you know, and there's, you know, you get your cool ending action scenes. I mean, with, especially Fistful of Dollars, I think, has the even stronger of the ones. I mean, it comes afterwards, what do you expect? But it has that real legendary moment where, like, he comes into town, and that one dude's telling him the whole time, he's like, any man with a pistol could never beat me with a rifle. <laughs> you know, one of those. Foreshadowing. Kind of that. And so Clint Eastwood comes in after he's been all, you know, beat up and mugged. Like, the, the only time that, because both those characters at one point, they they slip up, and actually, and Yojimbo is the one, because, like, the stupid family, the, you know, like, you know, you know, rape mom and, like, the, you know, her husband and son is like, yo, get the fuck out of here. I saved your lives. Don't you ever come back here. Don't you ever come back here. And they just sit there, like, praying to him, like, thank you, thank you. He's like, arigato, arigato. He's like, get the fuck out of here. Starts kicking <laughs> sand at him, like, throws money on the ground. Like, and then he has to pick it up. He's like, guys, you guys can't even pick up your own money I threw at you. <laughs> and then it's like, those are the people that fuck him over. It's like, they, he, he does all that. And then those people come on back to bring him a thank you note. I mean, <laughs> a nice jester, but uh, that uh, is what got him caught. She's like, guys, oh, oh, just like giving the mm mm kind yeah, of like, don't put, don't put my name on it. <laughs> you know, just anonymous, all right? Too anonymous. Leave it at that. It's be for the whole town. Fuck. And then, and, and Fistful, how, how does exactly this uh, Clint Eastwood get caught? It's because it's, it's not. The, they it's, don't get It's not the same out. thing. It happens though, because I want to say it's different in that one. He, um, I actually kind of forgot. That's how he got caught in that one. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, I want to say he just kind of slips up between jobs, like they catch him like he sends one group off to go do something else because that's that's most of the movie him like it, it's kind of hard to keep track of is this before or after he tricked them into going that way and he snuck into their house punched yeah. out the lady and x y and z um he was he slipped up and i want to say the big guy um i forgot his name but there's the big guy in the sombrero who he kind of fucks with i want to say that guy caught him and he just got smacked around. It was, oh, no, it was actually the night they were partying. They had a big party, and they thought he was out. And that's where he was snooping around. Like, oh, oh, so we see what's really going on here. And that's where they start beating the shit out of him. Yeah, because I think that's kind of how he gets caught and so on. Because he doesn't get caught by the people he saves. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so there's that there and so on. And, um, yeah, we're where I was getting to at this. Oh, we get to the ending, but you get to, like, the ending of Fistful of Dollars, and that's where it really has that really cool scene where, like, you know, he shows up, the guy shoots all his, shoots at him with the rifle, boom, hits him in the chest, falls over, he gets back up, like, you know, like a ghoul or something like that, continues forward, gets shot again, falls down, gets back up, and nobody gets like, what the fuck's going on? Why does he keep getting up, you know? Gets blasted a couple times, and so on, and then rips out the metal piece underneath the poncho, which is probably, like, one of the most classic scenes in almost any movie. I mean, shit, they well, use it in Back to the Future Part 3, which means they did it here in Tuolumne County. <laughs> good, the bad, the weird, yeah. Yeah, they, and the good, the bad, and the weird, and so on. Maybe not the version that, that that's in the, actually the Korean version, the version you, you asked, like, did they die? What happened, you know? But, um... No, like, that whole part, that, I guess that is a difference, because, um, um, Toshiro Mifune, he is, like, the, he has just raw skill, and Clint Eastwood, he's, of course, really good, but he's a lot more, like, scheming, he's a lot more, kind of, like, planning ahead, because he's just, like, he's right, I can't kill a dude with, like, a rifle from that distance, so I gotta cheat. Yeah, exactly, because he, he's just not nearly as good, but he thinks by having the power, more powerful technology, in a sense, that he'll be able to outbeat him, but nope. 
You know, and you get that nice, you just stare off, duel at the very end. They puts both guns on the ground, and they both go to reload it real fast, but Clint Eastwood's just that extra bit quicker. Well, there's even the part where, and to compare, um, to compare once again, Yojimbo to Fistful of Dollars, there's even the scene, like, I feel like they're more of, like, Fistful of Dollars, they have personalities, but they're, the villains are more there to hate them. You're not really there to like them, yeah. you're there to kind of hate them. That's the that's the same thing to Yojimbo, but Yojimbo, when he kills the bad guys, they suddenly start getting like kind of reflective on life. Like there's the there's the guy who's the smart, arrogant asshole who thinks, I got a six shooter, I can do whatever the fuck I want, like an American. You know, there's that guy. <laughs> he, once he comes in and he realizes, like, you know, because he throws the dagger at the guy's arm. He's just like, my, not my shooting arm! I don't know why he's Texan, but, you know. But, but, uh, he's the guy with the gun, so that's why I go that way. He's like, not my shooting arm, and goes down. Once that happens, like, that, then the guy starts kind of, like, you know, questioning what was his life, what was this. And then, like, you know, Mifuni's just like, oh, let's see what this motherfucker does. He hands him his gun back. Well, because he has he that, says, like, very he, Japanese thing, like, I feel naked without my gun. Please, put my gun back in my hand. It's the only thing I love. If I go to the afterlife, I don't want anything else but my gun. Well, even that part, because, like, you know, he threw the gun into his hand. He could still kind of hold it, but he couldn't really aim properly or anything like that. So, or not his aim, but his forearm. So, tendons are all fucked up. Mm -hmm. So, he can't, like, properly aim it. So, he gives it to him, knowing he's going to screw him over. But he's all like, you're not going to do shit. Here, fucking take it. Try. Yeah, exactly. Spend your last moments in life realizing you're a fuck up. Yeah, you just you literally just got taken out by a guy with a sword and you had a gun. <laughs> there is something, even though that character is probably meant to be one of the most dislikable characters in the movie, just for how cocky he is, there is something cool about seeing like a lax looking samurai with like a gun. There is something yeah. cool about that. And, I don't know. And why. just having his arms and like, you know, his robe and just pulling it out through like the top part, just like, oh, by the way. Well, because like both of those movies have like, I call it like the pretty boy guy in there because that guy's kind of the pretty boy in that one. And then there's that kind of blonde guy in uh, Fistful of Dollars who's kind of, kind of reminds me sort of like the similar character. He's a little bit different, but he's almost like, hey, there's the pretty boy guy there too who just thinks On he's. On the Baxter like, side? Yeah, he thinks he's just like the shit, but you know, not he's not really as good as he really thinks he is. And then you also well the even the, something they did with the um, those the Rojos and Fistful of Dollars, which is the more powerful team, mm -hmm. and they're just like a bunch of brothers, and they're kind of all just like varying degrees. There's like Miguel, who is like the psycho, who's just like rifle, and I love killing, ha 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 ha. And then there's the one guy, I don't remember his name, but he's a little bit more the guy with planning ahead, and being more methodical, and he's the guy who hires the man with no name in the first place. And there's the guy with the very irritating laugh. Who's just kind of like the middle oh. ground between the two. Yeah, he, he's just there to laugh over everyone's shoulder almost. I think he, I think the uh, sh the barkeep or the shop owner is the one that capped him in the head when like he like peeks his rifle through the window at Clint Eastwood. I think yeah, that's the very yeah, is. And the, yeah, he is. You know, Clint Eastwood saves him by you know they're gonna hang the poor shopkeeper, but he wasn't gonna give up Clint Eastwood no matter what. You know. I think I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think here because um, a lot of times Sergio Leone would use um, a lot of the same actors, but for different parts uh, in like later films. The guy who played Ramon—that's not the villain from. Uh, is that the same guy who played the villain in uh, for a few dollars more? Because I want to say. Yeah, that's the guy who's the bad guy in Few Dollars More. Yeah, he he, he always came across to me as kind of like proto Heath Ledger Joker in that aspect that he's like he's crazy he's not all there but for somehow he kind of stumbles his way into being a few steps ahead of everybody else and he's like let's see where this goes I don't know what's going to happen but let's just ruin these people's life because it's kind of fun to do yeah exactly he, he's just there to kind of cause that kind of havoc and so on you know and that can, what's that actor's name that's uh, Gain Miera uh, Valente yeah, I got one of those. I'm probably, mis guys. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. sometimes those Italian names can be a little bit tough. Yeah, but yeah. his character is. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that. What were you going to say? His character is Ramon, though. He definitely is probably the most. Um, even though that he is just kind of like the cocky bad guy with the rifle, he does come across as the most sinister in the whole movie. Where the Baxters, the, that husband and wife and the son, they don't seem like. 
they don't they, they do seem like a threat but they don't seem like the scariest people out there you know what i mean like they seem like here is our b villain as opposed to our a villain yeah exactly i think there's a little bit less to that there like not you know maybe like in a different sector they wouldn't be as bad as they really are you know kind of in this you know town that they're at where in yojimbo i felt like both sides were kind of to me the way i remember at least both sides being kind of more equal most of the time until you get closer near the end but i I think kind of going back off what we were saying where they're presented as buffoons but then they become more darker near the end it's when they set fire and the water there's no water to um put the fire out where they start getting way more like desperate and way more like crazy i noticed that at least that's how i picked up on it and that's when the, is that kind of like where they're going back and forth destroying each other's businesses where like he slices mm-hmm. the the one guy's socky like area and just like cuts holes in all of them and just leaking out everywhere and the guys like slipping on it and everything I'm like i just got mention what is it like if you're getting soaked with socky <laughs> and those guys just all their bodies just gonna all absorb and there's gonna be all just like so ridiculously hammered that they probably might die of alcohol poisoning it's like in beer fest when like they, when they like landfill or whatever his name is like like dr- drowns in a vat of beer and just sees just a huge grin on his face <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but um but yeah no these movies are just all around so much fun there's actually that one i was thinking of actually too there's that remember there's that weird like before django unchained Quentin Tarantino was in another Django movie that was that, like, kind of, like, almost like the anime-ish, live-action, weird... It, it's such a bizarre... I almost kind of want to give it another go, because I almost feel like I would almost appreciate its weirdness even more now. Before, I just remember going, like, this is kind of strange, but it was called... I think it was, like, Sukiyaki Western Django. It had the most bizarre... One of those titles, but, like, it came out, like, give or take, like, 2006, six seven right in that grindhouse kind of era, and it was just like, oh, Quentin Tarantino's in it, like, it's, it's gotta be amazing, and, like, the only scene that Quentin Tarantino's in in that movie is just this weird shot that's not, it feels like nothing else in the entire movie, like, and it almost feels like it's shot, like, on, like, a high school play stage, and they're just had, like, Tarantino sitting out in the woods with another guy at a campsite just talking, I don't, I can't remember what they were talking about, but I remember like it was just... Some, like, a snake eats an egg... And then he cuts the snake open, eats the egg himself. And then there's like a part where like he trains some badass lady and starts beating her in some scene. Yeah, you just... fucking cooked it wrong. You know, but, like that's my favorite. Thing. Like Quentin Tarantino, it's like here's the guy who's known as like the master director of all master directors. You know, literally up there of, you know, Steven Spielberg and like you know, um, shit. Stanley Kubrick and all that guys. But then it's like yeah. when he does it, I love that when he picks those random ass acting roles he does, they're like the most bizarre things you've like ever seen. Like I just always think there's another movie I had, it's called like Destiny Turns on the Radio. And there's a part that I just feel like only Quentin Tarantino could say, Oh hey, I want this to happen. Where I'm gonna rise out of like some motel's pool in like New Mexico and there's gonna be lightning and thunder and he's gonna come like, Whoa, I'm gone! Whoa! It's so strange. Well, it's also like I'm kind of since he's Tarantino, I'm wondering what happens when he gets on set. Like when when they're directing a scene, does he go like, "Are you sure you want to do it that way?" <laughs> or is he kind of like, "Hey, fuck it, it's your movie." Yeah, that, that, that's what I kind of wonder. I just feel like yeah, it's like what happens when Tarantino shows. That's gotta be like the most like, "Hey, by the way, what what actors we get? Oh, okay, we got these big actors. Oh, but we got Tarantino. Like, is if you're the director, you'd be like, no, don't don't bring Tarantino in here. God forbid, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stumble, I'm gonna trip, I'm gonna mess everything up if he's standing around. Not like in a bad way, but you know, like when there's somebody standing around you who it's that weird kind of thing that if you have somebody who's just more advanced than you, even though you know what you're doing, you just start messing up because. <laughs> And it looks yeah. like you have no idea what you're doing. And you and keep he's asking probably who- used to he's probably used to it to some extent. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that. Well, I mean, I guess like it, when it's Destiny turns on the radio, okay, Quentin Tarantino's not that advanced. He's only like two or three movies in by that point, you know. But he was already becoming a household name and people he wasn't like the biggest guy in the world, but he well, well he didn't probably have as much experience by then, but at the same time he clearly had like that by then that's pulp fiction. So, I, yeah, because you know. it's either 93 or 96, so it's either before or after Pulp Fiction. I can't remember exactly, but... If it's before Pulp Fiction, then it's probably a little bit more lax. After Pulp Fiction, then it's no, like, oh, yeah, shit. No, yeah, it's like, that's the number one guy, but... And then um, he's already had a couple movies that were produ- like, produced by him or written by him being made, so his name's already out there on other projects. But I'm just thinking about that, just, like, the idea of, like... <laughs> of just, like, 
Wait, wait, who'd you get for the bit part? Well, we trying to change the script a little bit for the bit part is, uh, for the cameo joke, we actually went with Tarantino. Well, fuck! That's gonna put so much pressure on us! You know, everyone's gonna be on edge, like, we can, we gotta look professional in front of Quentin. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, one of those ones, but, um, it would be kind of fun in a future kind of podcast to pick some of those other, like, those other Yojimbo kind of knockoff movies, because some of them just sound kind of cool and interesting just to try out. Well, the w one I, the one I, um, I, I wouldn't mind checking out again. Going back to the one you mentioned, the one where it's basically trying to be fistful of dollars in Yojimbo with a uh, major obvious samurai and um, west samurai western fusion, and it's kind of animation. I, I want to check that out again. I might have more respect for it the second time around. Yeah. But at the same time, I just remember it being feeling off about it and feeling kind of like you know because they're even making references to other. Tarantino, not uh, Tarantino, uh, Clint Eastwood movies. Like, like uh, they're referencing Outlaw, J Josie Wales, you know, they're doing... They're, I remember, that was the big one, because I remember at some point he's like, are you going to start whistling Dixie? And it's like, that line has no context to the scene right here. <laughs> You're not in the fucking South. Well, and then it, it even used, like, r original Django-type stuff, because they had the guys with the Gatling guns and all the super over-the-tops. I almost feel like it sounds weird. I remember kind of watching it, and it was like... I remember thinking, like, I didn't think it was bad or anything. I, just, I, I felt like kind of like a mediocre kind of feel. Like, that was cool, but... For some reason, I was expecting a little bit more, but I almost feel like I'd appreciate the weirdness of that movie even more nowadays, and I actually might like that one a lot more. I, I think I'd like to give that another go. I have it on DVD, but you know, it's one of those ones like I watched it once in like 2008 or whenever it came out, and then I haven't seen it since then. Same here. I might have to check it out again too. Um, it is though going back to uh, going back to like westerns, the whole I guess because Clint Eastwood ultimately kind of changed westerns, and so did Sergio Leone with this. I feel like that at the time this seemed like probably now it seems like kind of like Western by the numbers, but at the time, I guess it seemed very like, as you know, he wasn't the good, he wasn't Jimmy, wasn't a uh, um, Jimmy Stewart. He wasn't John Wayne. He wasn't Peter Fonda. He was like this. Is it Peter Fonda who is in? I, oh, there's, there's, um, Are you talk about it? Henry Fonda in a uh, uh, once upon a time in the West. Fon yeah, Henry Fonda, not Peter. Fonda. Well, well, he was. They, they hated Peter Fonda. I meant yeah. Henry Fonda. I meant Henry Fonda. Um, yeah, I mean Peter Fonda was like, "You're good. God damn it, your dad was a cowboy. Quit, <laughs> quit it being a fucking hippie. God damn it, cut that fucking hair. Get off that America. You're not. Don't Captain you dare America. call yourself Captain America. <laughs> Get off that motorcycle. Stop hanging out with fucking If it Dennis wasn't for Hopper. Captain America, we wouldn't have won World War II. You're disrespecting a legend. Uh, sure, that only happened in the comic books. No, that was real life. I was there with the, with the captain. Um, it, was, it was this thing, because I guess, you know, that's where you had the morally gray hero coming in and be, having a bigger part. Like, I'm sure there's a Western you could find in the black and white times that had that, but it was more of a... It was more. It became more popular with like spaghetti westerns, and I think um, on top of that, the stylization of it probably wasn't something that uh, people were used to at the time. Because thinking back, like, okay, the the guy like dragged like in Django, the guy dragged his guns in a in a um, coffin. Okay, that, that seems a little over top, but nothing too crazy. Then that had to be like, oh, we're watching Trigun or like fuck or some shit, you know? Yep. We might as well be watching. This might as well be. There might as well be like a robotic spider going by in the background, like in Wild Wild West. Yeah, exactly. I think that's because that's the thing is like both these movies, Joe Jimbo and Fist, are like that one where it's like they both kind of had like a more hard edge. They were brutal. They were, you know, for the times too, more violent and so on. Even though the 1930s movies are probably just as violent too, but we had the 40s and 50s in between, so there's there's a big change up, you know. And then like, um, you know, just like the cutting, the shots in it. There's both these movies are extremely artistic too. Like that's the other thing too. It's like they're action movies, but they're also just shot like amazingly too. You know, really well put together. You know, just using different stuff that people weren't doing. So it was like these movies really do change. They almost like create what would be like the modern action movie in a sense. That and also just thinking about something where you know because they would also have a lot going on in the scenes in Yojimbo. They'd have scenes layered. Like there's the part where they're in the restaurant and they're saying, "Look, I think the sake." I think the sake is like poisoned or it's extra or it's or the tea spiked or yeah that's what it is the tea was spiked yeah and they're kind of like 
they're watching they have like slits in that restaurant so they're almost kind of watching and commenting on that which at the time that wasn't very a common thing to do have that many things going on with all these people with their own goals and then you also have clint eastwood like his whole uh what was the example i was going to make with that oh, not strictly clint eastwood but the way sergio Leone shot at the time a common thing to do was show the guy firing the gun and then cut to the guy grabbing his heart falling over where this one, it showed him in the same shot shooting him, so it made less of a layer of, like... It's like, no, 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 there, there's a, there's consequences to the action there. Yeah, they're not happening separate and then kind of, you know, coming together and so on. So there is that kind of stuff. And it's not saying that, like, mm-hmm. you know, because West... I know sometimes I think some people do get this idea that Westerns kind of pre fistful of dollars were very like tame and that's not really true because like, you could find a lot of brutal westerns from actually like the 50s and stuff and you know especially if you go back to like 30s and 40s you know like you know kind of before the war is over you can get some ones there that are like still pretty hardcore but like this one did just it just kind of, i think it just did so much of it like, a lot of times certain movies back in the day they might have that like one or two kind of hardcore scenes you know what I mean? And then, like, the rest would be kind of, like, more balanced and so on, where this one's, like, the whole way through, it's, like, there's a lot of not good people here, you know, and bad stuff's kind of going down. I guess that is the thing. What's, I mean, it wasn't, like I said, this, neither one were probably the first to do it, but I think they're the first to get really popular about it, was having a, having a cast of characters where majority of them are bad. It's not that, like, oh, you have, like, here's your good guys and here's your bad guys like no 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 no. they're all mostly pretty shitty people it's just the main character well i mean yo jimbo he's he's a good guy uh-huh. where where he just has he does does things kind of shady where fistful of dollars man with no name he's an okay guy he probably is more good than bad but he's more self-motivated well they're both in a sense like anti-heroes you know, at the end of the day. I mean, I'll say this. John Wayne movies, technically John Wayne's mostly always an anti-hero because he's mostly always just the guy's like, ah, oh, if I ain't getting no fucking money, then I ain't doing no shit there. And just some of the other actions he does, but then he ends up kind of solving the problem at the end of the day. But um, but that's almost kind of how they feel. It's like there's these guys, like really, these guys, at the end of the day, I think they're definitely going to do the right thing, but they still could be involved in some shady actions too if the money was right. or so, You know what I mean? If it yeah, wasn't, if it wasn't to too it. bad, you know, the, these, you know, both these characters could be, you know, working like on the other side for a moment, you know, but they're not going to do anything too heinous. Exactly, exactly. But, um, but yeah, these are those kind of films. Like, if you've never seen these before, I mean, like, as long as you can appreciate good old classic films and black and white doesn't bother you, you know, they're both totally worth watching. They always hold up. Like every every time, it's like it doesn't matter. Every time you watch them, you're just like it's, it's always just as good as you remember it. You know, they're very solid the whole way through. You know, um, the action's fantastic and so on. Just, like, the battles in both of them, whether you get the Western shootouts slash you get all the the sword play and, you know, Jimbo and so on like that. They're both very cool. Yeah, definitely check these out. I'm glad because this is the first time I've seen Yo Jimbo, so I'm glad I finally got around to watching it. And it did not disappoint. I didn't think it was going to be... I didn't I didn't go in like, all right, let's get through this. So I was like, I was interested, and the movie did not disappoint at all. And I know that they are less Western-like as the sequels go on, but I still want to check those out. And apparently, I believe it's the second or third movie with uh, the uh, teacher, um, butchering his name, Toshiro Mifune character... Apparently, the second or third one is where there was a mess up on, like, um, somebody had, like, a little apparatus spray blood when they got sliced, and it, would ha- it happened wrong, and a big kind of anime-style blood squirt happened. That was actually the thing that inspired that, apparently. Oh, really? Huh. So that right there in film history and anime history is reason enough to watch it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know that there's only one more that's kind of, like, tied in that's done by Akira Kurosawa. But I think it fall. It's kind of one of those ones, like like many other things, people kind of took it and you know ran with it for more and more. Because I mean, it comes from Toho, the Godzilla company, so you, you know they're gonna go with it. Yeah. But um. But yeah. Beyond all that fun stuff, make sure you go to oldmanorange.com where you'll find more podcasts, comic books like Pizza Boys, old animations, and all that fun stuff. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. And I'm Ryan Dunnigan. Hey, we'll see you some other time. Later, folks.